Do we go? Yes. Ladies, gentlemen, very welcome at France School online every Wednesday, but with four different formats, as you have just seen. This Wednesday, FSR Talks. We are hosting Peter Arte from the US and a bit of Australia. And we have to discuss the gas crisis in the EU and relations with US with this dream. Can US rescue us this winter? As you all know, the entire world is facing energy crisis, but also here and there, food crisis, other material crisis, and sometimes component crisis or labor crisis. In the EU, we have something on the top, if not at the bottom, energy war with Russia. And from yesterday, you have seen that it's a war. So sometimes gas pipes can explode under uh, anonymous forces. I cannot say that's life, but that's the ordinary word we use. Huh? It's, but the better word is that's war. It doesn't tell how we have to think about it, because even energy war has to follow rules and constraints and possibilities. To look at it, as I said, we will have Peter. Peter Hartley is president of the International Association of Energy Economics. He got his PhD at University of Chicago, then he has been assistant professor in Princeton, and then a career in Australia, and currently in Texas, really an energy state, at Rice University. To discuss with him, two people from France School, plus me. First, we will have Sophia Nicolai. Sophia is research assistant at the France School. Before that, she was intern at the European Agency for Energy Renovation. And second one is Alberto Podocinic, today with us at Front School as director for the world of practice. It means the companies and public authorities, sometimes also NGOs. Before that, for a decade, he was director of the European Agency for Cooperation of Energy Regulators. We are going to start. Peter, will open the session by presenting how he sees basics, basics of gas economics and policy for about 10 minutes. Then we will have Sophia for 15 minutes discussing with Peter, I assume around these basics. Then Alberto for 15 minutes again, discussing policy, policy options, future, etc. And then the audience for 15 minutes, you can all ask any question in the box Q&A. You will see on your screen Q&A box, that's the one to ask questions. And if we are lucky at the end, I will give five minutes to Peter to conclude because we are at challenging time. Huh? As you see, uh, Alberto, Peter and me, we are not kids. Sophia, we can discuss. I'm joking because Sophia is a really your friend. But uh, we cannot say that we know everything. Huh? We, we, we try to understand, but it is challenging. Peter, you have the floor, 10 minutes. Thank you very much for your uh, warm welcome. And thank you very much for uh, inviting me to take part in your session. And uh, I hope that uh, we all uh, cover some very interesting questions. This, well, this morning for me. Um, uh, the uh, afternoon for you. Um, let me, oh, wait a minute. I th think I should not have, uh, there we go. Uh, I assume that uh, you can see the full screen. Yes, we do. My, good. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, what I've done is I've just prepared a few slides first to set the scene uh, for our discussion. And uh, given we're talking about uh, what's happening in the EU uh, and the possibility for the US to uh, provide some help, uh, this is a picture from uh, based on BP Statistical Review of World Energy Statistics 
of European natural gas imports over the last decade. And what you can see down the bottom, the grey, is, of course, imports, pipeline imports from Russia. And uh, we can see they've been pretty steady, but they've been by far the biggest component of, of European natural gas imports for, for this decade. Um, the other sources, we've got the Africa, African pipeline, or well, pipeline imports from uh, North Africa. Other uh, former uh, Soviet Union uh, states is the grey. Uh, some uh, from the Middle East, uh, and then at the top you've got LNG, and it's interesting. LNG imports uh, fell in the early uh, teens here in Europe. That's partly because there was a big demand for LNG in Asia, and so the LNG went to Asia rather than Europe. But you see, even before the uh, invasion of Ukraine and the latest crisis, that LNG imports into Europe were picking up. Uh, so. Uh, uh, you know, this LNG has become increasingly important, uh, even without uh, this huge import of importation of gas from uh, Russia uh, being cut off. Um, to put this, uh, go, focus on the LNG um, trade in particular, I've put together here now again over the last decade, uh, just to give you an idea of, of what the LNG market looks like worldwide. On the top, I've got major importing of group countries into regions. So the major importers of LNG uh, at the top. And on the bottom, we've got the major exporters uh, of LNG. And you can see that the main re region for importing LNG is Asia. Of course, Asia started the LNG trade, uh, really. Uh, Japan was, was uh, very early on after the 70s energy crisis. Uh, Japan uh, wanted to diversify their sources of energy. And uh, one option they saw was uh, LNG. And they developed initially uh, LNG exporting from Southeast Asia, Indonesia in particular, but then also Australia. Uh, so we still see this, this area here as Australia and Southeast Asia are still big exporters of LNG. And then uh, more recently, the Middle East, particularly Qatar, got into uh, exporting LNG. So they're also a very big uh, exporter. Um, after that, we've had uh, sub-Saharan Africa, you know, Nigeria, Angola, um, particularly. Um, and then the Americas in here and Norway, I put together as it kind of exports into the Atlantic uh, Ocean. And you can see the increase here at the end. This is the US. So uh, after the shale revolution in the United States had a lot of uh, more natural gas, um, the United States was expected to become the biggest importer of LNG early in the uh, 2000s. And a lot of import terminals were built in the United States to get ready to import uh, LNG. But uh, the high prices in the United States that were stimulating the development of those LNG import terminals also stimulated the development of the technology that enabled the production of natural gas from uh, very uh, uh, impermeable shale rocks. Uh, and this is uh, now, now, now allowed the United States to turn around to become uh, one of the biggest exporters of LNG, possibly the biggest for a short period anyway, because um, Qatar is also undertaking a major expansion, uh, which will be online probably in a couple of years. So uh, uh, that will bring probably Qatar back to being the biggest uh, exporter. Um, the second, I'm going back to looking at imports after Asia, uh, Europe has also been, uh, uh, you know, the next biggest importing region, actually. So it's this next red colour. And we have uh, the Americas. So um, uh, some of the countries in, in Latin America have, have been uh, sizable importers of LNG. And then actually the Middle East itself, some of the Middle East countries uh, have more oil, but they don't have so much gas. Um, and then uh, going back to Europe and focusing uh, on Europe itself, uh, this is LNG imports into Europe now. And uh, you can see that this dark red is Qatar. So Qatar has been a major exporter to Europe. And as Europe increased its LNG imports here in 2019 and 2020, you can see that Qatar was a major source. Um, and then the pink here is the United States. So the United States had been growing here as the major uh, exporter of LNG to Europe even prior to 2022. Um, and then other major sources, of course, Algeria again, uh, uh, Nigeria, and after the United States here, notice Russia. So Russia not only 
supplied Europe with pipeline gas, which is what I showed you in the first picture, uh, it also uh, was a source of uh, LNG imports into Europe, particularly from Russia's uh, European uh, you know, um, Yamal uh, uh, export plants. Um, and then on the, it's also interesting to look at the import side. So uh, mainly the biggest importers into Europe, of course, are the countries that have access <laughs> to the Atlantic Basin. So we have see Spain, the UK, France, so the first three, uh, and then Turkey is in here, but then also uh, Italy, uh, Netherlands, Portugal, Belgium, uh, Poland, and some of the ones in Eastern Europe, uh, Greece, Lithuania, and others. Um, this has it's important to know which countries have importing facilities already because that um, limits how you can use LNG to replace Russian pipeline gas. Uh, so, for example, Spain here is a major importer, but the pipeline connections between the Iberian Peninsula and France are not very large. And so the, your ability to import more LNG into Spain and then have it shipped north to substitute for the Russian gas, that's limited because of the limited capacity of the pipelines. Uh, other pipelines have to be reversed. It takes investment to reverse the flows in Europe. And then, um, you know, to put in LNG, new LNG terminals takes a certain amount of time, regasification terminals. So G Germany, for example, is talking about building new terminals, but it, uh, putting new terminals in, but it takes uh, some time to get them operational. Um, some years ago, a colleague of mine, actually a former student of mine, uh, Ken Matt, Professor Ken Medlock here at Rice, and I wrote a paper on uh, Russian uh, natural gas trade to Europe. The question we asked at that time was, would it make sense for Russia to restrict natural gas supply to Europe in order to extract monopoly profits? And what we showed is that if Russia tried to do that, yes, they could, by restricting supply, not cutting it off completely, but just restricting it, they could drive up prices and raise their profits in the short run. But that that would trigger investments in Europe, investments in, in uh, new LNG import facilities, uh, investments in new pipeline capacity, investments in reversing the flow on existing pipelines and so forth. And the longer run consequence of that would be that Russia would face more competition and probably therefore lower prices in the long run. And what we showed was that trying to, uh, this is a purely economic question, trying to, to extract monopoly rents in that way would probably uh, result in Russia having uh, a loss in profits in net present value terms. So the short run profit they could get would be more than offset by the longer run loss from the increased competition. Of course, that's a different question we're facing now, which is a complete cutoff uh, for, for non-economic reasons. But uh, it's still instructive, I think, to, to see that uh, you know, what, what their model implied about the kind of investments Europe could make to, uh, to try to get around a restriction on Russian exports. I'll turn next to, to US uh, exports. And this is uh, based on data from the US Energy Information Administration. So basically, this is from the beginning of US LNG exports. So I mentioned earlier that um, the US, US was going to become a major importer of LNG and they built all these import terminals. Then, of course, they started had a uh, dramatic increase in domestic production. And then eventually here in 2016, some of the import terminals were turned around to be export terminals, which required billions of dollars of investment, actually, to, to turn them around. Uh, and I'm going to show you a picture in a moment of the, the actual terminals in the US. But um, you can see that um, where the exports have gone. So the blue here is the Americas. So a lot of the uh, US exports to begin with here, the majority were going to, to the Americas. And then the orange is Asia. So increasingly we had, and particularly our, uh, you know, as the teens moved on, uh, Europe here is the grey. And as I showed you before, the US had become a major e uh, exporter to Europe here in the last couple of years. And you can see that in the grey. And on the top is a little bit going to, to the Middle East. So um, it's sort of interesting. Uh, one thing about the US uh, terminals is their geographic location is interesting because um, you know, they are in this situation where they can easily export to the Americas. And with the widening of the Panama Canal, they can export more to Asia. And of course, easily export to Europe. So uh, they're in a very good position to arbitrage the different markets around the world. And that has meant that the US terminals, many of them have kept 
uh, more of their exports uh, available for spot trading, just so they can undertake these kind of arbitrage trades and are able to swing their, their sales to different parts of the world, depending on price. And that's what you can clearly see in this, this picture. And I've, I have a paper coming out um, uh, in the Energy Journal, the IAE Journal, um, sometime here soon, where I've, we, again, Ken and I looked at a uh, typical export project from the United States and, and discussed how um, it can make a benefit from, from uh, exploiting this kind of optionality. Uh, in, in where it sends its exports. Um, here's a bit, another picture of, of what's happening. Um, you can see uh, the, the, in the background is total US LNG exports. Um, and this gray line is uh, the U Energy Information Administration keeps a or collects a price index for prices paid for LNG exports uh, from the US. And that's uh, represented in this gray line. And you can see the huge increase and in run up here even before, so this is on the right-hand side is the prices, uh, the, the, the uh, bars are measured against the left-hand side, there's the volume of exports. You see, even before the Russian crisis, uh, we had an increase in, uh, in LNG prices. The red line underneath is, is the US price, Henry Hub. And of course, there's a gap between the two because it's expensive to liquefy natural gas, expensive to transport it. You have to keep it uh, minus 163 degrees Celsius. And then when you get to the destination, you've got to regasify it. Uh, and then ejected into the pipeline system. So uh, the price for pipeline gas in Europe, you know, the gap between that and the pipeline gas in the United States is going to have to cover the cost of regasification, shipping, and, and liquefaction. But you can see a clear relation. This spike, by the way, is because of the freeze we had in Texas in early 21, which uh, <laughs> led to a, a, a big increase in gas prices, at least big big for the United, by United States standards. You can also see prior to this period when we didn't have so many exports, essentially the US price was pretty much unrelated to the world price. But more recently, there's a definitely a relationship. Um, so these prices that we're seeing, uh, in high prices we're seeing in Europe and so on now have actually driven the price in US up to close to $10. Um, and the final slide I have here. I've forgotten, uh, Peter, you are Sorry? very late. You have to shorten. You are very right. late. Oh, sorry, last slide. <laughs> My last slide. Um, so this is the actual uh, facilities in the US. Um, and uh, the question is, what, what is the possibility for, for um, expanding it? These are the new, this is the new capacity that due to come online. You can see not, not, not ready before January 24. On top of that, in, it's sort of interesting, in June 2022, there was a fire in the Freeport terminal here in Texas. Um, and there's been a lot of debate about what caused that, getting back to Jean-Michel's comment on, on explosions on pipelines. Uh, there was an explosion on the pipeline uh, taking LNG uh, from the tanks to the ship here in Freeport. There's a question as to what, we know what happened. There was a, one of the lines was overpressured and, and it ruptured, but there's a question as to why it was overpressured. And uh, there's been uh, unfounded speculation, which I shall put it that way that some hackers may have, uh, <laughs> perhaps from Russia, may have been involved in, in, in that. But anyway, uh, it's cause yet to be determined. But the Freeport terminal is, is quite big, a uh, part of the US export capacity. We're back to 85% capacity, they say, by the end of November, but not 100% until March. I'll leave it there um, and open it up to uh, questions from Sophia. Many, many thanks, Peter. It was extremely interesting. Sophia, you are the youngest generation at front school. How do you see it? What are the burning questions you have? You have free hand to ask Peter anything you have in mind. Yeah. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Peter, for the interesting uh, presentation, because I think it was important to understand the general situation. So what we are talking about. My questions, I think they are more uh, on the basics as you as you already mentioned, because I think they're important to cover the basics to properly set the scene for the debates that will focus mainly on policy uh, later with, the, with Alberto. So the first thing that maybe I would ask you to clarify is um, if, you, if you could give us some uh, insights on the difference between conventional gas and shale gas, because I mean, we're talking about Europe and then we're talking about the US. So mm -hmm. this is the first question to, to clarify a little bit the situation. 
Right. So the, 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 there are a number of ways of characterizing this. Um, the, the one one way I've heard it characterized is conventional gas is hard to find but easy to produce, whereas unconventional gas is is easy to find but hard to produce. <laughs> so conventional gas is in a reservoir under pressure, and as soon as you you uh, penetrate that reservoir, the gas produces itself. You know, it's because it's under pressure, it comes out by itself. Whereas, whereas shale gas is, is in uh, impermeable shale rock. It sort of looks like a, a piece of concrete, actually, if you see it. And, uh, and, and even if you drill a well into that rock, uh, the gas will not be released by itself. So what you have to do is you have to crack the rock. So they, they inject water under pressure into the rock and it cracks, it makes lots of cracks in it. And then the gas can escape through those cracks. Uh, and then later on, they figured out how you can do this also with oil. So initially, uh, shale uh, uh, only produced gas. Then as they've improved the techniques, they've been able to produce light oil from these uh, shales. Uh, but we only get about 10% of the gas that's in the shale. The, the big thing about these uh, shale uh, reservoirs, too, is that they're a very large area. So uh, there's a tremendous amount of oil and gas available in these rocks um, uh, simply because they cover such a large area. And because the uh, oil and gas doesn't move by itself, it stays there, you see, mm. until, until okay. you liberate it. Okay, yeah, that's, that's clear. I mean, the, the shale, the technologies that allow us to, uh, to extract shale gas, shale oil, I think uh, it is clear that they had tremendous impacts on, uh, on US and the energy security of the US. So my, my second question would be to understand a little bit better the uh, gas pipe delivery versus LNG. So mm -hmm. also the speed at which it is possible to invest in infrastructure, uh, the possibility uh, to, 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 to transport this type of, uh, of gas. Right. So, so LNG is really just a transportation method. That's what it amounts to. So um, you, so you can, imp you can uh, transport natural gas under pressure in a pipeline. But if you want to uh, go a long distance, and you can even do that under the ocean, by the way, you can transport the, you know, like, for example, North Africa to Europe, as I mentioned, and so on. Uh, you can transport uh, natural gas in a pipeline underwater. But um, if you want to go over a long distance over water, the pipeline is very, very expensive. And so uh, what the only way of doing it was, this is, as I mentioned, started to supply Japan in the 1960s. Uh, you um, liquefy the natural gas by cooling it down to minus 163 degrees Celsius, it becomes liquid under pressure, and you put it into a, basically like a floating thermos bottle. <laughs> That's what an LNG carrier is. Uh, and because you, um, uh, when you cool it down and make it a liquid, you increase the energy density by a factor of 600. So you can, you can, uh, it makes it economic to, sh to ship that gas, you see, but still not cheap. Because you've got to cool it down, that takes energy to cool it down, and, and then the and the these ships are not that cheap to build, and you've got to they're under pressure and they've got to have cooling and so forth. And then when you get to the other end, you have to have a regasification plant, which then turns the liquid gas uh, back into the gaseous form, and then you put it into the pipeline. So um, so that's the big difference. Uh, so LNG is just a way of transporting it now. I think there were other parts of your question or I've forgotten. What, did I answer it all? No, I mean, this is the, the main point that I, I was asking. Yeah. Oh, I know, what you, I know what you asked was how long does it take? So uh, there, there are, there's a time involved in doing all this. So um, it takes several years at least. It depends on the country, of course, and the state here in the United States. <laughs> so Texas is probably friendlier to infrastructure development than some other states. But... Um, uh, to actually get a liquefaction terminal, build a liquefaction terminal, um, you have to get permits, you have to get environmental impact statements. Sometimes you have to increase pipeline capacity to get more gas to the terminal. Uh, then you've actually got to build the liquefaction facility itself, the port facilities, uh, deep in the port and so forth. Uh, often, if you're going to have more LNG trade, we have to build more LNG tankers, these specialized ships. Uh, when you get to the other end, you need regasification terminals although these days we have floating storage and regasification units they're called 
And those are much easier to put in place, so much quicker to put in place and much less expensive than uh, the old style onshore terminals. Um, and then, of course, uh, after you've got the terminal on the other end, you may have to invest in new pipelines or increasing the capacity of pipelines or reversing the flows on pipelines to get that gas from the import terminal to where it's needed. So there are lots of investments along that uh, delivery chain. And all of those take time and the amount of time depends really on the jurisdiction. <laughs> Uh, yeah okay yeah, yeah that's clear and since you mentioned that uh, to, to build LNG facilities it is required also an environmental impact assessment basically so mm -hmm. which uh, is a question that comes to my mind is uh, are there eff effectively um, some some risks uh, like environmental risks and uh, or is is it just something that uh, um, an assessment that is done in order to prevent possibilities but I mean, are they, these facilities, can they present some risks, some environmental so, so risks? So you mean environmental risks? So um, I think the main thing, I mean, the substantial port works often are involved. So there could be disturbance of, of marine life, marine ecosystems and so forth in the port. Although, uh, for example, in the United States, the first um, uh, the LNG export terminals that were built, as I mentioned, they turned around import terminals. So they already had done the port works and so on in those cases. So those terminals were able to be developed more quickly because um, you know, the environmental impact statements and so forth had already been done for the port works when they were import terminals. Um, in some cases, so some of the export, one of the big export projects in Western Australia, uh, developed by Chevron in Northwestern Australia, uh, the the liquefaction plant is actually on an island off the coast, and that island was a nature preserve. Uh, and uh, the company had to do very strict environmental impact statements and take very special measures and so forth, not to disturb the wallabies and, and uh, snakes and lizards and so on and so forth on the island, right? And uh, the construction costs were, were quite high. It's one of the most expensive. People talk about that. They talk about Gorgon Project. They shake their hand. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> that was billions and billions and billions. But part of the reason was because they, they built it on this, this nature preserve and had to take very special precautions when they were building the facilities not to disturb all the wildlife. Um, okay. So, again, it depends on, on, on the country and uh, so forth. In terms of um, sort of uh, explosion risks or anything like that, uh, it's interesting, I mentioned this Freeport incident in June 8, 2022, this year, June 8, where you had this uh, overpressured pipeline which ruptured and they had a small fire which um, lasted only 10 seconds. Uh, and uh, there was no release of any toxic uh, waste or anything that they've detected. The fire, other things caught fire and those other things were put out in about 40 minutes. So, um, I mean, there are some risks, anything, you've got a flammable gas, you know, so yeah. if you get leak uh, and the sparks around and so forth, um, you can have problems. But these facilities um, are monitored all the time and when anything happens, they have automatic shutdown um, uh, procedures and so on and so forth. So there's been no major kind of uh, incident at any of these facilities. Okay. Uh, Okay, thank you for, for clarifying. I actually have a, one last question, but I don't know, Jean-Michel, if we want maybe to pass the word to Albert and I will keep my oh, question for the go end on. or... Okay. So I, want, I, I was wondering the uh, impact of the recent uh, uh, rising inflation on the gas sector in mm. the sense that we see uh, more and more uh, higher prices and uh, like a production that is not... Uh, apparently incentivized by these higher prices in some areas of the world. So is this the model that we're going to face in the future? I mean, uh, lower mm. production and higher prices, or do you think there will be a sort of unblocking of the situation in the next, uh, I don't know, in the next years at least? Very good questions. Yeah, so um, actually in the oil and gas industry, the, the people talk about what they call the rush to drill phenomenon. So what they mean by that is, is that when there's a high prices, uh, everyone wants to try to, to get the supply available to take advantage of the high prices. But what that does is it raises the cost of all the inputs. So it raises the cost of renting a drilling rig. It raises the cost of the workers to work on the drilling rig and 
raises the cost of, in this case, in the United States with shale, it raises the cost of trucks and sand and water, everything, because everyone's trying to get access to the same things at the same time. And so this is not unusual. So th this is just another example of that. Although this time around, uh, things have probably been exacerbated a bit by COVID, the COVID cutdowns and the supply shortages and other area industries and so on that we've seen. So, you know, some of the pipeline shortages and things like that um, may not be the usual rush to drill. It may be worse than usual because of the, um, you know, the, the, supply, the other supply issues that people are having, other companies are having. But there's other questions too. So here in the United States, um, in order to get gas to the export terminals, uh, you need to have extra pipelines built. So if you're here in Texas, for example, uh, to get from West Texas, the, the pipe, the ex LNG export plants are on the coast and uh, the pi current pipeline capacity is not enough to get all the gas to the coast. So it takes time to get those permitted and built and, and costs going up makes it, more difficult for them as well. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, it's certainly an issue uh, at the moment. And of course, the other thing that's going on right now is in fact, the current administration, it's kind of ironic, I think, from the point of view of you people in Europe, that uh, for a long time, you say, you've been saying, uh, I wish we had a US government that would be going along with European climate policy. But now you have a government that's going along with European climate policy. And the consequence is that this administration has had the lowest allocation of new leases for oil and gas drilling on federal land, possibly for 100 years. I mean, extremely, extremely low, right? And they've also blocked a whole bunch of pipelines and so on on the grounds of climate. And so uh, something that's slowing down the ability of the US, in fact, to supply gas to Europe is, is that the current administration is being very European in their mm -hmm. environmental policy. <laughs> So uh, it's just a, a rather ironic. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. Thank you for the for the clarification. I think that uh, now we can move to Alberto's questions that maybe will be more on the on the policy side and how effectively uh, can US rescue uh, the EU. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you yeah, Alberto. Yeah. Thank you, Jean Michel. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Peter, for a very informative presentation. A lot of information shared. Um, um, as, as you know, Europe is now struggling to deal with the current crisis and um, there are two dimensions. One is the internal dimension, you know, how we deal with the very high prices. And the second one is how do we maintain uh, flows into Europe? So um, maybe later on, I will also ask you about how you see a potential price cap in Europe. But before that, uh, if a price cap is imposed or even not, if flows from Russia um, are further reduced, then Europe will be looking at LNG. And you mentioned the fact that some LNG facilities keep the options of directing um, cargoes to wherever it's more convenient. And at the other end, you know, I think India and Pakistan are complaining that Europe is outpricing them. Now, how much, L how much more do you think US LNG could come to Europe? And this has, I think, has to do with the price, elas well, first of all, the physical capacity limitation, but also the price mm. elasticity of supply and the price elasticity of demand from other regions mm. uh, importing LNG. What's your, what's your view on this? Well, I think that uh, uh, there's a lot more opportunity to redirect flow. Uh, as I mentioned, um, some of these uh, terminals, particularly the ones in the US, have much less of their capacity uh, under long-term contract. But even when you have uh, LNG under long-term contract, uh, you can uh, it, it can be redirected, right? So you can use uh, other swaps and so forth. So a Japanese utility, for example, power utility that had a contract to import LNG, could choose to say, okay, well, uh, the price of LNG is now so high that what we're going to do is we're, this LNG that we've been allocated, we've got the right to buy it at a contract price, but we're going to sell it to Europe as <laughs> a spot price, and we're going to generate our power by importing coal or uh, by restarting a nuclear plant. And indeed, you know, we're seeing Japan wanting to restart a lot more of their nuclear plants. And so a lot of the utilities that have the right to import LNG don't necessarily have to import it. So uh, quite a bit of the LNG 
can be and will be redirected uh, based on price. And uh, uh, one reason the Indians and Pakistanis, I think, are complaining is that they had chosen not to sign long-term contracts. So uh, uh, they've been much more exposed to the spot market prices. Uh, and therefore, you know, as the spot price goes up, uh, it becomes very ex expensive for them to import uh, LNG. Um, and so they will be uh, shut off or choose not to take it and then try to, to generate their power some other way, probably, probably again coal. Um, so by the way, I mean, that's the reason why coal prices are rising, have risen a lot around the world too. So uh, a lot of countries are choosing, um, you know, to to uh, burn uh, coal to generate power rather than using natural gas, LNG. So, so you, you can, it, just because something's on a long-term contract doesn't mean that it's not available for sale elsewhere, and that happens. And do you have any clue as to what price, you know, what, what the price has seen in the sense, you know, what further increase in prices Europe would have to bear um, you know, to attract additional um, LNG because there are different stories, you know, saying that beyond some certain price levels, demand from other countries is pretty inelastic uh, and that yeah. we've already exceeded that price level, um, you know, the switching rate. Yes. Uh, so, so at the end of the day, I mean, as I mentioned, you, you have to have the other customers have to have some alternative energy source. And uh, it costs them it might cost them something to to uh, get those facilities back operating and uh, use the alternative. And then those those alternatives probably are more costly for them. That's why they were using natural gas in the first place. Plus, uh, there's environmental regulations and so on. So uh, their ability to use the alternative is going to be constrained by by the governments. Uh, so uh, you know, as you as you redirect more and more of that gas, uh, it becomes more and more difficult. You know, you, you, so the utilities that can switch more easily because they have alternative power plants, you know, they're going to do it first. And then as time goes by, you, you know, it's, it's focusing on Japan or China, uh, which are big importers, like South Korea, um, you know, once they've switched back to using alternative fuels or, or, or nuclear, um, then we can't that's when it becomes really inelastic, right? So basically, you've got to you've got to compensate them for for using some alternative. And the big the big most elastic use, honestly, is in the power sector, sure. because you can generate electricity, you know, in many different ways. Uh, but everyone's going to be very reluctant to cut off uh, natural gas for heating, and really probably for chemical industry too, and chemical uses. And going back to the food question, I mean, that's another thing. I mean, natural people don't realize. Natural gas is very, very important for food production. So nitrogenous fertilizers are all produced, you know, using uh, natural gas, and uh, so uh, and that's really important to being able to feed the feed the world, uh, given the number of us, number of mouths that we now have to feed. Uh, so uh, na uh, natural gas plays a very important role in agriculture beyond just thinking about it as an energy source. So, uh, and of course, the chemical industry uses a lot of natural gas. Um, yeah, there are substitutes for some of those things, um, but uh, the more you try to substitute something else, the higher the price. Right. Um, now, I think you showed a, a graph that uh, compared the price in the US, the price in Europe, and, mm -hmm. and, and the price in, I think, was the Far East. And you sort of explained the difference uh, yeah. on the basis of costs. Well, I mean, is that, is that all? Uh, actually, the, the price difference uh, that I showed was actually the LNG price, yeah. uh, export price from the US uh, and the Henry Hub price. Yeah. Is that, is that all? Is that uh, no. So, so, so uh, that um, gap will, of course, reflect um, uh, an implicit scarcity rent for the liquefaction facilities themselves. So given that difference right now, a price signal is being sent to the market. Please, please give us more liquefaction capacity. So that gap would narrow if, if you had more liquefaction capacity. But as I mentioned uh, before, it, it uh, takes time to build those plants. So right now, um, you know, uh, look would look to be very, very profitable to build one of those plants, but you just can't do it overnight. And so um, uh, that gap is not just reflecting the cost of liquefaction. It's also right. a scarcity premium.
So there is, I, I guess, from what you're saying, there is a limit to the extent uh, to the extent to which uh, the U.S. can further help Europe. If yes, Europe definitely, has, irrespective of the price, I would say, you know. Yes, exactly, because because there's, you know you have to have these you have to have these liquefaction capacity, and so uh, there's just a, only and I showed you the last slide the, the the actual amount of capacity. Now this coming winter, as I mentioned, we did have this this problem at Freeport. Uh, which is here in Texas, and uh, that that uh, caused a, a big shutdown, uh, the Freeport um, uh, plant, uh, which is about one fifth of U.S. export capacity. Uh, they say by the end of November it'll be eighty five percent. It'll be back to eighty five percent capacity, the Freeport terminal, and one hundred percent by March next year. So uh, that will that will increase the capacity. Okay, excellent. Maybe the, the final question before we go to the audience, and maybe Sophia, you can in the meanwhile see what we, we, we got, because I think actually one question was exactly on the Freeport terminal, but I think Peter has already replied to it. Do you have any view of something which has been finally discussed in Europe as a more urgent measure, which is a sort of a, 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 a cap on the price of gas? Is this sort of mm. technically feasible? I mean, we wrote couple of weeks ago we wrote a paper saying if we need to do it this is a way of doing it but what's what's your view it would be very interesting to hear about your view okay so a price price cap of course means you've got to use non-price rationing <laughs> of some sort <laughs> right and um uh non-price rationing usually is less efficient than uh price rationing so it's you know it's going to go according to some arbitrary rule some rule um uh, rather than necessarily where it's uh, most valued use. Uh, so that's the first thing I would say. Um, the second thing I would say is, as we've just been talking about, these price signals are one thing that leads people to redirect LNG flows um, and uh, you know, to, to use alternative fuels in Asia, to, to spend money to reopen facilities, to use alternative fuels and so forth. Uh, uh, and if you put a price cap on gas, uh, you, you, you're reducing that uh, response, right, from the rest of the world to 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 get get the supplies to Europe. Um, the other thing that I've heard people talk about is not so much a price cap on gas, but a price cap on alternative sources of, of electricity generation. Now, it's true that just like we were talking about the the price gap between uh, LNG prices and domestic prices in the US is sending a price signal to add capacity. One could argue that um, the gap between electricity prices and the cost of producing electricity in Europe is also sending a signal. Please give us more power generating facilities based on something other than we've got now and so on. But again, it takes time for those to be built. And you might, some people might say, well, we're going to, uh, we think that that rent, that scarcity rent uh, is not really doing very much at the moment to stimulate investment. So we're going to take some of that away and, and use it to subsidize prices to consumers. Uh, of course, that reduces the incentive for people to make those investments. Sure. But um, uh, that's a longer run problem. And it's, that's for next year's politicians. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, okay, thank you very much. Sophia, do we have, because we have very specific questions I saw and the other ones we probably have already uh, replied. Um, have you picked up any there was one on the free port, but you already answered. Yeah, for example, there was another one on the, I don't know if you uh, are able to give us some insights about this, uh, Professor Hartley, uh, the situation of the Keystone pipeline. If that, yes. This is something that uh, frames in the, in, the, in the picture. Right. So the Keystone pipeline, of course, was an oil uh, pipeline. So um, th this was to bring Canadian uh, oil uh, to the Gulf Coast the United States for refining. Um, there already is pipeline capacity from, from Alberta into the United States. Uh, and the uh, Keystone Pipeline project had two legs. One was uh, international from Canada to the United States. The second one was within the United States, an expansion of, of the pipeline capacity to go from uh, the Canadian border down to the Gulf Coast. The reason the industry wanted to do this is that the Oil, people don't realize that oil refineries in different parts of the world uh, uh, are set up to refine specific 
types of crew. And the refineries on the US Gulf Coast were set up, uh, set up to, to refine very heavy crude from Mexico and Venezuela. And the problem with shale, as I mentioned, the oil coming out of the shales is actually very, very light. So it's not suited to the refining capacity that's on the US Gulf Coast. So the idea is, you know, we should ex the US would export its light oil to refineries in Europe, mainly, or, you know, to produce gasoline and so forth. But then uh, 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 import Canadian crude to, to refine that here on the Gulf Coast. Uh, and that would make a lot more sense in terms of efficiently using the world's refining capacity. But Keystone uh, became a cause celeb for the environmental movement. And uh, they said, no, 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 we can't have this. It's, we've got to stop fossil fuel development in Canada and so forth. So we're going to block this cross-border pipeline and became the political football and the Biden administration, the very first act, the very first thing that Biden did was cancel that pipeline as a symbolic act. This is re less relevant to Europe because it's, it's oil, right, not gas. Less relevant to the current situation. However, uh, much less publicized uh, is that the various other gas pipelines in, the, in North America, not in the US and Canada, that have been stopped on the grounds of climate change issues, which do affect the ability of the US to export natural gas, produce natural gas and export it. Um, and, and also the ability of Canada to, to export, produce and export uh, natural gas. So as I think I mentioned earlier, these um, uh, constraints on pipeline development have uh, had an effect of limiting how much uh, uh, natural gas you get out of North America. Right, maybe, maybe there is another question which actually relates to uh, your comment on coal beforehand, because actually not only in the US, in, in Europe as well, um, you know, um, the resurgence of coal and coal use in for power generation and other usages is clearly something really new with respect to the trend, which was towards um, sort of cleaner fuels, etc. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see the, I mean, the, the, the short-term emergency sort of um, resurgent of coal vis-a-vis -vis a policy that has been, you know, trying yeah. to penalize coal, trying to support clean, te uh, clean technology, et cetera. Right. I mean, the the EU, UA, the allowances in Europe, the price has been over the last few uh, months, a year and a half, two years, you know, as high, uh, much higher than it has ever been. Um, and, and yet now we're trying you know, to go back to coal. So how do you see this from the US perspective? Oh, I think that I, I do think that this is a temporary thing. I mean, as I mentioned, um, uh, with respect to natural gas, uh, LNG, we, we, we have quite a few proposed uh, facilities under construction. I showed you ones in the US that the extra capacity that's coming online. As I mentioned, Qatar is, is dramatically increasing, uh, almost, uh, let's see, uh, five sevenths increase. Um, of its export capacity uh, will be online within a couple of years. Uh, there's the uh, Mozambique um, offshore project. Um, so there's a, quite a bit of natural gas, uh, LNG capacity, uh, you know, due to, to come online over the next five years. Um, so, uh, and as I mentioned, you know, what's happened is a lot of coal plants have been shut down, um, but they they were able to be brought back into service. And so as the, uh, gas prices has gone up, people are bringing them back into service. But it's not as if they're building new plants. I mean, China is still building new plants, of course, and India and so on, but not in Japan so much. Well, I guess there's some under construction in Japan, I've got to say, but that was more of a longer run thing. And I think in Japan's case, uh, you know, there was a lot of concern on the, on the utilities for uh, whether the nuclear would be allowed to be brought back online. I, I think the current government in Japan has made the decision to reopen a lot of the nuclear. So uh, I think longer term, that's that's more uh, more feasible. So so I see this as more of a shorter term uh, accommodation for, for the very high gas prices rather than some uh, longer run trend. Okay, excellent. Uh, well, I don't know, Sophia, if uh, I, well, there are a lot of very specific questions, but I, I don't think we need to go into specific. I have here, referring to the study that Russia is not able to increase monopoly yep. rents. Yeah, they did increase their monopoly rents, of course, in the short run, what we showed, but it's just that 
Well, as the prices go up, it does trigger all these sorts of investments, as we've been talking about. Uh, and so it, over, after a few years, you know, you, you have new investments in new pipelines, reversal of flows on pipelines, LNG, import facilities, and so forth. And so in the longer run, it actually erodes Russia's uh, strategic uh, situation. I, actually, I had a, a PhD student a few years ago, Natalie Hinch is her name. In part of her dissertation, she looked at um, Russian uh, uh, sales of na uh, natural gas into Europe and what she showed was, was that, you know, the, the further you were from Russia, <laughs> the better price you got. <laughs> so if, you, if you're right near Russia, uh, you had few alternatives, you got charged a higher price. And so what she looked at was the appropriately named independence terminal in Lithuania. So Lithuania built this LNG import terminal. Um, and uh, uh, as soon as they had the terminal in place, you'll notice my, my graph of the imports. Uh, Lithuania was not a big importer of LNG. But just having the, the ability to import, all of a sudden, uh, Russia was facing much more competition and the price that Gazprom could charge dropped. Mm. And what she showed was is that the price reduction Lithuania got just by proposing a competitive threat to, to Gazprom, uh, that price reduction by itself paid for the cost of the terminal. <laughs> So um, uh, the, trying to exploit these, this uh, monopoly or you know, dominant market situation uh, does stimulate alternative investments, which then uh, erodes uh, Russia's competitive position in the longer run. That, that's kind of what we showed in that paper. Yeah, and indeed, you know, in Europe at least, uh, the proximity to TTF has been the main driver on the um, sourcing cost of gas. And actually, this has been spreading out over the last 10 years. I mean, I think the first time the agency looked at it was 2013, and it was just a few countries around the Netherlands enjoying the benefit of competition at TTF. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A few years later, with the increase in capacity and the better location of capacity, then you ended up having you know, a wider region of countries right. within one euro of right. TTF. So uh, clearly competition Make, I mean, competition is more important than cost. Of yes. And that's what producers. I, so that, as I showed, you know, the LNG imports in Europe in the last few years, even before the invasion of Ukraine, had been increasing. And I think part of that is exactly that uh, countries were importing LNG as an alternative to Russian gas for economic reasons. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, Jean Michel, I think we are now getting. Okay. Then I will ask Peter for five minutes to conclude about uh, economics, policy, and regulation of gas, US versus EU. And maybe you can say also something about Australia, if you feel Australia <laughs> is bringing something interesting into this. Okay. Um, well, I, there's lots of things I guess one could talk about. I mean, um, one, one, going to the US, uh, one thing that's very interesting about the North American natural gas market is a um, very competitive pipeline uh, transportation system network. Of course, you need a very dense network, but here there are very many ways of getting gas, let's say from the Texas uh, to Chicago. Um, I was speaking to one of my former undergraduate students one day at lunch, and he's, he was involved in the business. I was talking about the business he was in where he was... Um, figuring out ways of, of rooting gas actually from, from the U from Texas to Chicago <laughs> and you can go to using different pipelines and so forth. And so uh, over here, th there's a market in the use of pipeline capacity every day. Uh, and uh, people are sending gas in all sorts of different directions based on the price. And so you have a lot of, a lot of, so if you build a pipeline, the, the rate of return you gets regulated, but the use of the pipeline, is determined in a competitive uh, market. And, uh, uh, and I think it's very instructive for the rest of the world to, to pay attention, look at that uh, US system. Um, uh, and it gives us, it gives a very, um, uh, very good, good, very good way of, of uh, ensuring efficient utilization of the capacity um, and a very efficient market. Um, one thing that's interesting, uh, though, in the United States, the, the retail or, or, the, or the price of, while there's a market in the use of pipeline capacity, there's not a, a, a 
an auction wholesale market. So in terms of Australia, one thing that's interesting there, I, another one of my PhD students just completed her dissertation last year, looking at um, the Australian gas and electricity markets. So just like we have a wholesale electricity markets, you have in a lot of the developed countries now, uh, Australia is one of the few countries where they have wholesale, wholesale gas market, where they set gas wholesale gas prices every day via auctions, sort of like an electricity auction. And um, uh, that seems to, um, I think, be an interesting, I mean, one thing that's wrong, I think, with the Australian market is it's perhaps not as competitive as it ought to be. And I would say that with electricity markets. My number one uh, feeling all the time about uh, these markets is it's very important that they be very competitive. It's not much good having a market price set if the market price is a distorted one because of monopoly or oligopoly, right? So it's... I think to get the most benefit out of these kind of markets, you need, need it to be very competitive. But um, uh, there's interesting interactions between the gas market and the electricity market in Australia, which uh, is worth looking at. But I think this whole idea of, of trying to use auctions to mechanisms to uh, settle wholesale prices is a good one. Thank you, Peter. I think we are going to conclude. But before concluding, and I will already thank Peter because it was extremely interesting, well-informed, and very clever. And uh, I'm very honored having you as a friend, Peter, because uh, this quality of knowledge for gas uh, affairs, gas economics, is very difficult to, 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 to get. Uh, Danny, you had uh, a slide uh, introducing the next FSR talk. Thank you. As you can see, ladies and gentlemen, Every Wednesday, you have FSR online, always free of any charge, and us, FSR Talk, every month. So next time will be the 19th of October, 2 p.m., 3 p.m. Central uh, European time, and we will look at communities, and we will look at two angles. Can energy communities contribute to the transition? Uh, and to solving the energy crisis. I know we are dreaming again, but uh, we are going close to Christmas, so you have the right to, to dream. I will be the, <laughs> the introducer. We will have three guests having worked on the topic. Sabine Lebe from Reutlingen University in Germany. Feridon Sauyushansi from California, Menlo Energy Economics and David Robinson, a British from Oxford Institute for Energy Studies. I will again thank Peter and of course the, the, the reviewers, the, 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 the debaters, Sophia and Alberto, and I wish all of you, dear uh, audience, a good week and meet you again next week online and for us, FSR Talk, meet you again next month online. Thank you very much. And, and keep